Have you ever noticed that a ball, or really any inflated object, seems to feel different at different points in the year? In the summer, a properly inflated basketball will feel firm and have a proper bounce. But that same ball might feel softer in the winter. Similarly, a car tire on a cold morning may report low tire pressure and be seemingly fixed by the afternoon heat. Although many inflated objects will slowly deflate over time, these changes may also be related to the natural behavior of gases. This behavior is not only dependent on the quantity of a gas, but also its conditions, such as temperature, volume, and pressure. In this video, we'll explore the properties of ideal gases and the conditions under which real gases deviate from ideal behavior. We'll also delve into the molar volume of a gas at standard temperature and pressure, and solve problems using the ideal gas equation and combined gas law. Most gases that we interact with on an everyday basis and in the lab are considered ideal. But what does that really mean? Let's start with a couple assertions. An ideal gas consists of moving particles with negligible volume and will feel no intermolecular forces when they collide with other gas molecules or the walls of their container. We can make these assertions for good reason. In terms of magnitude of size, gases are much smaller than the containers in which they typically exist, so much so that we could ignore their individual volumes. Gas particles are also spaced relatively far apart and are constantly moving at high speeds. This means they won't have much opportunity or ability to feel intermolecular attractive forces with other particles. As a result, collisions between particles are considered elastic, meaning no kinetic energy is lost during the collision. This is the difference between colliding two chunks of clay, which will stick to each other and form a clump falling to the ground, and colliding two billiard balls, which bounce off one another with no real loss of kinetic energy. With no intermolecular forces, gas particles will simply not stick to each other upon collision. With this in mind, there are of course conditions that will cause gases to deviate from this behavior and act as real gases. These conditions negate the assertions we made from before and force us to contend with intermolecular forces and molecular volume. Particularly, we see this at low temperatures and high pressures. At low temperatures, particles move slower, and intermolecular forces become more significant. We no longer have elastic collisions. At high pressures, the volume of the particles themselves become significant compared to the overall volume of the container. We can no longer ignore them. These conditions ultimately lead to deviations from the ideal gas model. But outlining the ideal behavior of most gases is really important for our conceptual understanding and for making our lives easier when it comes to completing calculations. Namely, we see this in the ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT. This powerful equation demonstrates the relationship between the pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount of an ideal gas. Pressure, P, is measured in pascals and is the result of the force created by the collisions of gas particles at the walls of their container. Volume, V, is the volume of the container measured in meters cubed. Moles, N, is a way for us to count the number of gas particles. And temperature, T, represents the energy of the particles and is measured in the unit Kelvin. R in this equation stands for the universal gas constant, equaling 8.314, joules per mole kelvin. This constant makes our equation true, and as the name suggests, will not change. If you're new to the unit kelvin, this measurement of temperature follows the same unit scaling as Celsius, but with one large distinction. While the Celsius scale extends into the negative degrees, the kelvin scale shifts everything down so that our temperature values start at absolute zero. Thus, to relate Kelvin and degrees Celsius, we follow this relationship. Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273.15.
Not only will this equation help us solve calculations involving gases under various conditions, we can also use it to tease apart relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and moles to better understand how these ideal gases behave. One such calculation that is solved by the ideal gas law is that of the molar volume of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure, known as STP. At STP, temperature is measured at 273.15 Kelvin and pressure at 100 kilopascals or 100,000 pascals. If we rearrange our ideal gas equation to solve for the volume of one mole of a gas and plug in our values at STP, we find that one mole of an ideal gas will always have a volume of 0.0227 meters cubed, or more commonly, 22.7 decimeters cubed. We could then use this as a conversion factor. Let's see this in action. A helium balloon has a volume of 2.0 decimeters cubed at STP. What mass of helium is contained within this balloon? To start, we'll find the moles of helium in the balloon, using the molar volume of a gas at STP as our conversion factor. From there, we can multiply our molar amount by the molar mass of helium, where one mole of helium weighs 4.00 grams. We find that our two decimeter cubed balloon contains 0.35 grams of helium. Ultimately, the ideal gas law is a powerful tool that unites three fundamental gas laws, Boyle's law, Gay-Lussac's law, and Charles's law. Boyle's law states that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume when temperature and moles are held constant. Remember, pressure is the result of gas particles colliding with the walls of their container. So if the container volume is reduced, the number and rate of these collisions will increase and therefore so will the pressure. In other words, for this inversely proportional relationship, if you decrease the volume of a gas, its pressure increases, and vice versa. We can derive the equation for this relationship using the ideal gas law. Consider a gas whose container has changed volume. We can use the ideal gas law to define this gas in its initial and final conditions. Remember that, for this example, temperature and moles must be held constant. This means that between these conditions, only pressure and volume are changing, which we'll mark as P1 and V1 for the initial conditions and P2 and V2 for the final conditions. Notice that although these variables have changed, they're both equal to the same constants, nRT. So if P1 times V1 equals nRT and P2 times V2, equals nRT, then P1 times V1 and P2 times V2 must equal each other. This equation defines the mathematical relationship between pressure and volume, as outlined in Boyle's law. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Gay-Lussac's law states that the pressure of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature in a rigid container where volume and moles are held constant. The speed at which gases move is in part determined by their temperature. Therefore, increasing the temperature of a gas, for example, would cause those particles to move faster, leading to more frequent collisions with their container, and therefore create a higher pressure. Pressure and temperature are proportional, which means that heating a gas will increase its pressure, and cooling a gas will decrease its pressure, assuming volume stays the same. We could again derive the equation for this relationship using the ideal gas law. This time, pressure and temperature are our changing variables. And if we solve for these variables, we find that they are both equal to our constants in R over V, showing that P1 divided by T1 and P2 divided by T2 must equal each other. This defines our relationship between changing pressure and temperature, as outlined by Gay-Lussac's gas law. P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. Charles's law tells us that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature in a flexible container, where pressure and moles are constant. This is a little bit different than our last example. Think of a flexible container like a balloon. If you warm a balloon, the previous gas law states that the internal pressure will increase, 
due to the increase of collisions with gas particles and the walls of the balloon. Flexible containers are particularly sensitive to the internal pressure of the gas they contain and the external pressure of the gases in their surrounding atmosphere. When these forces are not equal, a flexible container will expand or contract until they're balanced. In this case, the balloon will expand upon being heated until the internal and external pressures become equal under our new conditions. Temperature and volume are proportional, which means that increasing temperature will increase volume and vice versa in a flexible container. We can again derive the equation for this relationship using the ideal gas law. This time, volume and temperature are the changing variables, and if we solve for these variables, we find that they're both equal to our constants in R over P, showing that V1 over T1 and V2 over T2 must be equal to each other. This defines our relationship between changing volume and temperature as outlined in Charles's law. V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. The combined gas law brings these three relationships together into a single equation. P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. This equation is particularly useful as it allows us to predict the new state of a gas given its initial conditions and any changing variables. Let's say, for example, you have a gas with an initial pressure of 101 kilopascals, a volume of 10 meters cubed, and a temperature of 300 Kelvin. If the volume of this gas is changed to 5 meters cubed and its temperature to 200 Kelvin, what would be the gas's new pressure? Well, in this problem, pressure, volume, and temperature are all changing. In fact, we can identify each variable within our question. This means we'll need to use our combined gas law. To start, we'll rearrange the equation to solve for P2, the new pressure of the gas inside the container. From there, we could plug in values for our variables, being sure to convert our pressure into pascals, and we find that the final pressure in our container equals 135,000 pascals. In summary, we've covered the key assertions and limitations of the ideal gas model. We learned about the molar volume of an ideal gas at STP, and how real gases deviate from ideal behavior under certain conditions. We also explored the ideal gas equation, gas laws that show specific relationships between our variables, and the combined gas law that brings it all together. Understanding these concepts allows us to gain insights into the behavior of gases in various situations, providing not only a foundation for more complex topics in chemistry, but a better understanding of the world around us and the gases that we interact with on a daily basis.